real estate companies aren't making a lot of money right now. All but guaranteed that an offer of compensation in the MLS will be gone very shortly. If a buyer were required to pay the commission, it does have an impact on who can afford to purchase. If you're an agent representing buyers and sellers, I, th I think you should be aware but you don't have to be as concerned. The best thing you can do for your financial future is to put three more into contract. If there's some serious flaws in the business models, like big problems there, because all those leads are no longer leads. But if you spend time studying what you do with a buyer, you spend way more time with them and working with them than you do with a seller. I want my gladiator that goes into the arena to do battle for me and help me yeah. win. I don't yeah. want someone who's representing most. It would make sense to be able to communicate to the agent population that a seller is willing to offer a commission to the buyer's agent. Okay, what's up, everybody? Uh, Ricky Carruth here. Good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. I've got James DeWiggins here, CEO, co-founder of Next Home. I also have Keith Robinson, also connected with Next Home. What's up, fellas? What's, what's going, going on? on? How are you? Dude, what are you I drinking? Am... Fresca? Is that a Fresca? Every, every, every time I take a sip of Fresca, I get a new listing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the secret advice. Everybody needs uh, to follow. Yeah. By the way, hey. I have them in my fridge, so that's why yeah. I was asking. Podcast so, over. Uh, that's dude. all you need to know, party people. Yeah. Drink Around Fresca. The end. Drink Fresca, pick is. up listings, angels get their yeah. wings, and I'm just yeah. rolling there in. There it is. I thought that was Red Bull. I, I double up, though, too. I got a uh, Coke Zero. <laughs> So, so you have Double commitment fisting, issues does that get you buyers is, <laughs> is the coke exactly. buyers and then the exactly. connecting mm, buyers uh, and sellers here coke buyers it's now good to head. see you guys man um you too james if you could maybe just tell everybody um who you are what you do uh so oh, i run uh uh, next home, the national real estate franchise with my partner in crime here keith robinson um we uh in our spare time, also do a podcast, uh, which we you were you graced our podcast as well, which we were excited about. Um, called Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered, which we did as kind of a fun outlet <laughs> for Keith and I to pontificate <laughs> yeah, on the know. industry, and now it became this like thing. So yeah. it's like another project for us because it's gotten a lot of traffic. But anyway, so yeah, we do that. Um, I've been in the real estate my whole life. Um. My grandfather started a real estate brokerage in 1967. Damn, uh, I wasn't I even am, born yet. You were not, we were close, but. Easy, I'm easy. Just kidding. Uh, so yeah, I've been in the business my whole life, third generation. Um, and it's been a roller coaster, my friends. Been through <laughs> yeah. ups, downs, ups, and then downs, which we're where we're currently at. So. When did, when did you guys start Next Home? 2014 is when we launched the company. Um and it's been, it's been a ride. We, uh, we bootstrapped the baby and nine years later, we have about 630 offices across the U S and we do a little bit of business. So Are you guys in all 50 States or 49, 49, yeah. Which we, one we cannot figure out how to get into South Dakota. I just don't, I mean, there's only like one city there anyway, but like, <laughs> so <laughs> if you're listening in South Dakota, we're just kidding. Yeah. I mean, we're not kidding about not really. being there, but it's kind of yeah. sparse. Yeah. <laughs> cool cool and then then you you started out selling real estate or how like what did you do at the very beginning when you got into the industry were you a real estate agent listing and sales or did you get yeah, right so, into like more like manager team you know stuff or marketing or something like that um i'll let keith share his version mine's kind of short I, I worked at my parents real estate company to begin with and it was a small mom and pop shop that they they did um, did a lot of stuff with them. Then I got into tech sector, um, and started and sold two tech companies in residential real estate. We were, um, we had created WordPress before WordPress. So we were very far ahead of our time and we created signature <laughs> software before DocuSign. So again, we were very far ahead of our time. Um, both those companies I sold in 2001 and then 2006 respectively. And then from there I got into, <laughs> I was sitting on the couch, <laughs> unemployed because I sold the company and one of my clients <clears throat> has like, you're being a lazy piece of shit. You need to come work for us and do something. So <laughs> I, uh, it's actually a true story. And I was like, no, I don't want to do anything right now. And basically I went to work for a regional franchise here in Northern California called Realty World. Um, and they had about 420 officers. They're a big organization in Northern California. And so I went there and started as the director of technology. And then I worked my way up to vice president and then 
ended up buying them in uh, 2014 when we started Next Home and ran both companies side by side for a while. Keith's my story is more interesting. And but then yeah, you not really. Them, but... Now, now Realty World is Realty World. Longer. We sold in 2020. Yeah, gotcha. so we only focus on Next Home now. Yeah. Ah, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then Keith, what's your? That was not planned. That was like perfect timing. <laughs> it was February 2020. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, it's, it was it's, good kind, timing, it's kind of like selling a tech company in 01, right? I mean, that's yeah. the dot com bubble, huh? Yeah, top of it. <laughs> we uh, we sold, uh, we did virtual tours actually. Um, we had a photography network around the country. We used a technology called Be Here. They were out of Silicon Valley. They had these big camera domes, and it's a long story, but we did a first virtual tour photography network when I'm going to date myself now when iPix and bamboo.com were the two major players. There was <laughs> them and and USA Virtual Tours, which is the company we got, we uh, got bought by a newspaper firm. I can't remember who the hell it was now, but it was a long time ago. So, mm. yeah. Wow. Mine's not cool. so interesting. I started uh, 25 years ago in residential real estate, representing buyers and sellers, um, but missed that sort of small business startup uh, vibe and jam because that's what I had done before. Uh, so went down the leadership track for residential real estate. A tiny little company called Keller Williams was coming to Northern California. <laughs> uh, but at the time they were, no, I remember making recruiting calls for KW when they first launched and I would call and say, Hey, it's Keith Robinson with Keller Williams. And they would say, yeah, I don't need to buy paint because they would smush together Kelly Moore and Sherman Williams. Yeah. Uh, launched a bunch of offices for them in Northern California. One point in time, I ran the 19th largest real estate company in the nation uh, funny story. I was like, okay, I'm done with all the corporate shit. I'm just gonna, you know, I don't know, I'll do flips, some ground up construction stuff, uh, maybe a little regional private money bank. Um, and James reached out and said, Hey, I'm launching this new thing. And I said, nah, man, like I love you, but I just can't do the corporate thing anymore. He's like, come on, just, just come take a look at it. So we met, he's like, it's got this great name. I got this great concept. And I was like, yeah, no, that's really cool, but I'm good. He's like, okay, we'll just, help me out. He's so good. Right. He's like, help me out. I need to solve a mortgage situation. Uh, so just come solve that problem for us and then we'll see what happens. Of course, as I got to spend more time with the leadership team, all of whom I tried to recruit at different times in my career and couldn't. So proof James is a better leader because he recruited all of us. No. Um, but in the end, I remember that feeling being very early KW where like, I was like, damn, I don't know where this is headed, but it's special. And in the time that I was spending with Next Home working on this consulting project, I was like, Shh, I don't know where this is headed, but it's going to be special. And you don't always get an opportunity to be part of the leadership team for something that will be significant. So I said, yeah. And here I am eight years later, nine years later. Um, and he's completely miserable. It's like a marriage. No, so. that's not true. I love almost most of most of my days. I'm kidding. <laughs> so yeah, that's my background. Well, I mean, you guys are crushing it. If you're in 49 states, you got all these offices. How many agents? We have about 5,500 agents, and uh, we do a, quite a bit of business. So obviously, the market's down a little bit here, but we'll close the year out probably close to 30,000 transactions and over 12 billion in volume. So the wow. company company does some good some good business. Yeah. So very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. So I was thinking about which way to take this conversation because there's so much you know going on for, yeah there's, well, there's, <laughs> there's so no much, drama in residential real estate so much like um you know knowledge you know on this on this show hmm. and just is that the buyer is, can is that another buyer yeah, yeah buyers buyer can. yeah men at all get a seller connect <laughs> yeah. them but um i mean like what number one i, I do want to touch on not necessarily the lawsuits because like who who really i mean at this point who cares about that it's uh it's kind of become a moot point, honestly, with um, just like every day there's a new one and it's the yeah. same old stuff. And Copycat. Uh, everybody kind of knows what, you know, they've done their own. They've dug into it as much as they want to and they kind of understand to whatever level they want to, um, you know, what what's happening there. I, do, I would like to talk about um, like certain scenarios that could play out and um how that could affect agents and uh what agents can do what we think agents should be kind should they even be concerned i want to go down that road a little bit um but i also want to talk about you know like w w when you guys bring agents in right do you guys have in-house coaching in-house training like what are you guys doing to help agents 
you know, double their volume when they come over, uh, get going as a new agent. Um, you know, what do you guys have in place there? And what kind of, are, you know, what direction are you, you guys going with agents in terms of lead gen and different things like that? Are you so guys, where do you want to start? You want to start with you, the lawsuit side? Yeah. Yeah. Let's start there. Okay. Um, you go first, uh, James. Then I'll, I'll, uh, you do play by play. I'll do color. Okay. Go. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think they do need to be concerned about the lawsuits for a, a variety of reasons. Um, you know, one is their brokerages are, uh, in many cases are already being sued. Uh, litigation, uh, defense costs are astronomical when it comes to antitrust litigation. It's very expensive. It's a very specialized practice of law. So they're having to hire, they can't just use their general counsel basically. So they've got to go hire a firm that understands, you know, antitrust, federal antitrust issues. Um, and it's happening at a time when brokerages are, are broke. The first part of that word is <laughs> broke. So, you know, real estate companies aren't making a lot of money right now. And like, look, agents think brokerages make all this money. They don't. Okay. You actually have to remember that you keep a majority of the split. And, and so these companies, because they're, they're the fiduciary are going to bear a majority of these defense costs. And depending upon the firm, they either can afford it or they can't. And if they can't, then the only option is bankruptcy. And I'm not suggesting that's going to happen everywhere, but I do think you will see that occur depending upon who the defendant is and sort of what their cash flow is and what they can they can spend on on defense. And I think agents do need to be prepared for that. I think they also need to be thinking very strategically about what is going to happen with these these cases. The DOJ just came out, said that they're not happy with the no select settlement proposal. They want an outright ban on an offer of compensation in the MLS. I think that needs to sink in. Like you're going to see a world, whether it's done through these civil cases, through the Department of Justice or through the Federal Trade Commission, <laughs> you've got three entities or three different directions that are hitting on changes in our industry. I think it's all but guaranteed. And I'm happy to go on record as saying that all but guaranteed that an offer of compensation, the MLS will be gone very shortly. And so what does that world look like, right? How are you going to provide information to a buyer's agent? How are you going to bring a transaction uh, together when the DOJ and these government agencies, as well as the plaintiffs in these cases want a world, this is the, this is the world they want. They want the seller to pay the seller's agent they want the buyer to pay the buyer's agent. That's fundamentally what these things are about. Yeah. That's fundamentally where they want it to go and fundamentally where it's going to end up. What one do you think way buyer or the wants, other. Right. So the plaintiffs are sellers so far. There's a case with buyers who basically are saying <laughs> like they wish they could have negotiated and I guess paid their own commission. But do you, this is seller saying this. The seller they they want the seller to pay their commission, buyer to pay their commission. What do you think the buyers want? Well, the buyers would prefer to have it be the old way, especially your first time home buyer, right? Um, the downside to this is that if a buyer were required to pay the commission, it does have an impact on who can afford to purchase, right? We already have affordability headwinds in the United States. That'll only be exacerbated if the buyer is required. And we'll unpack a little bit if you want, like some solutions that we see, um, but you don't want, if you want a robust real estate market, and by robust, I mean buyers can buy and sellers can sell, whether whether prices are trending up or down. You want liquidity and in, in ease in and out of a real estate market. Mm -hmm. You don't want anything that adds headwinds to the first time home buyer marketplace. So, and that will be a real issue. There are some ways that you can work around it and there's some, some skills that James and I have been telling anyone who listen they need to develop and work on, but it will get a little harder to sell a house. If that if everything that we think will happen will happen, it will get harder for the entry level buyer to purchase. I want I want to add one uh, small point to what James said. I agree like ninety percent with what James said, but part of the reason we get along so well is we don't ever always agree. Um, look, if you're an agent representing buyers and sellers, I th I think you should be aware, but you don't have to be as concerned. And so, like concern and aware to me are two different things. 
And if you're an agent representing buyers and sellers, the single best thing you could do for your financial future, lawsuit or not, is put a few more into contract. And so be aware of what's going on. Be thoughtful about it. Uh, we'll talk to you about some skills you should be working on if you represent yeah. buyers and sellers. But don't get obsessed with the lawsuit talk. Don't go watch hours and hours and hours of James and I's podcast. I mean, do because, you know, it makes us feel good and our moms like it. But most importantly, the best thing you could do for your financial future is to put three more into contract. Yeah. So be aware prepare for what a likely outcome is, but don't let it distract you from your sales business. I think that last one's important. Prepare. Just, yeah. just plan, but you're right. Yeah. Like don't, this is going to take a lot of time for it all to figure itself out. So don't like, you know, stay up late at night worrying about it. Let us do that. But yeah, you know, now broker, a broker concern. Okay. Broker, if you're a broker, you need to have a higher level of understanding and awareness because at some point you may get named in a suit, right? And so at, you need to be thinking a little bit more and have some more concern than an agent who, I don't mean just in the, you know, air quote, just representing buyers and sellers. So broker, you should be concerned. Agent, you should be aware. Everyone should be preparing for what is probably on the other side of this, which is a change in the way business is done. Do you think two two questions? Do you think that individual agents could eventually be called into suits? And number two, when you ban commissions from being offered on MLS, is it a complete ban rule? Can't do it, even if the seller wants to do it. That's let's do this. Let's, let's do the do second the, one first. Or you want to do the, the first one first? No, we'll do the second one first. I actually just had this conversation, so it's kind of relevant. The answer is the DOJ wants it removed completely. The fight's going to from, from, from the, the MLS. MLS. Right. right. But that yes. won't preclude a, a seller can still, look, it's still America mostly, yeah. right? <laughs> like if a seller wants to give the buyer's agent money in order to facilitate a transaction, a seller can do that. And that won't change even if compensation is removed from the MLS. So it will become another term just like, I, I don't know, you know, everyone listening is from all different places, right? But everywhere you've got who pays for what, the, all the check boxes on the contract where you say buyer pays for this, seller pays for that, we split it 50-50, and you've got norms in your local market for who pays for what. There's going to be a new item that you're going to get to negotiate someday in the not too distant future that is going to be buyer commission. And every area will generate its norms, and there will be different solutions in a really competitive environment. In the same way you tweak some of those terms on the contract agreement, you're going to tweak some of those so that your offer can be more acceptable. If it's a non-competitive situation and you kind of tweak them the other way to benefit the buyer and the seller may carry some additional costs uh, in the contract, it will be this will be one more term and condition, albeit a big one, right? So because there's high, there's a lot of dollars associated with this in the grand scheme of a real estate transaction. But it's really like if you want to simplify it, it's one more term and condition that you're going to negotiate in the future. I completely agree with everything you said, and I'll just add one. I don't have anything else to add to it other than I think the 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 fight you're going to see. Well, let's just put it this way: the fight you will see 100 is. The DOJ wants the offer of compensation removed in the MLS. They're going to get that. The question is, is can we have a field in the MLS that allows the seller credit or concession to, to Keith's comment? They can do, okay, we're going to offer money for a 2-1 buy down, or we're going to give you $5,000 to fix the deck, or we're going to offer the buyer's agent 1% to help close the deal. Like I think that's that is a very realistic thing because but they can't, but would they be able to put that in MLS though? I mean, well, that's the, the question. Is no buyer commission. Then that's not commission though. That's a credit. The, uh, the seller is allowing to offer a credit to whatever that they want to do. So it can be just think of like an auction website. Like you can't prohibit a seller from the keys comment. Like if I want to give an extra incentive for somebody to buy my car, I have every God given right in this country to do it unless we want to destroy America. I mean, there's a question there, but like the reality is if a seller wants to say, I want to do something, there should be in a mechanism, but it's not an offer of compensation. It's here's a field that you can put things into for whatever that scenario is, which to Keith's comment will vary by market and time 
and space and, and area transaction and transaction right? yeah. because well, if, well, if it, we're going to put something in mls that doesn't say buyer commission but it really is it's well it where it's not where I, it's the 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 different where i think and look we're all we're forecasting here right. pontificating speculating yeah. that's all fancy words for saying yeah, talking I'm out of our trying to understand like, yeah 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 we're all guessing that I, could play out you know that's the head thinking about this a lot it's like okay buyers are saying well we don't even need agents everything's on zillow it's like well, sure. do you realize that we, that's not even why you need an agent Number most two, buyers aren't really saying that though right, right. some are but some most are. aren't some are yeah. But the mm -hmm. ones that are that think they understand, okay, let's take those those buyers for example. You know, they're they're like everything's on Zillow. Well, if you take buyer agent commission off of MLS, off of MLS, okay, now now why at that point is Zillow? Zillow's going to move their business model over. They're not really going to necessarily be syndicating all these listings for free if they can't sell buyer leads, correct? Yeah, well, let, let's unpack that a little bit, right? So, um access to information has done nothing but gone up over the last decade, right? So the human being who buys and sells a home, their home, has more access to information about the residential real estate process, values, everything than they've ever had in the history of the world. And over the last decade, it's spiked. It's a hockey stick. More information, more information, more information. You know what's happened to the use of a real estate agent over the last decade? It's gone up, not down. So more the more complicated it gets and the more the human being becomes aware of the complication, the more we look for another human being to shepherd us through that process. Mm -hmm. So I think use of a real estate agent on the other side of this will probably go up, not down. I'm basing I, that I, off of the history. I agree. I agree. I've been yeah. talking about that. The value of agents. Yeah. I think we lose a lot of agents that don't understand how to navigate or adapt to the sure. new market but Fine. The ones that left the value of those agents actually increases in the new market Correct. because and one thing is I, that i'm trying to wrap my head around is is why are why why would zillow continue to syndicate mm. where's a different problem for zillow right theoretically uh if <laughs> i think it's a good problem actually because i think a different business model like a pay-to-play like homes.com or whatever my, well, zillow my, has yeah he's got this really good one by the way that's like, well so it, our belief james has, has alluded to it our belief is that you will have every state that will require a nat a buyer broker agreement they'll all be a little different based off of state norms etc but there are 12 13 states it's now 15 14, is what 15. i've heard yeah it's 15 states require it so they require a buyer broker agreement that means when you meet with a buyer and you say i want to be your agent then you sit down and you go over what you get paid, how much, and by whom. And, and that the buyer and what agrees. You do. Yeah, and what you do. And the buyer agrees, if no one else will pay you, I will. That's most buyer broker agreements that I've looked at. I have not looked at all 14. So if I, I meet with you and I sign, sign, we sign a buyer broker agreement, you now we're committed to working together and working together exclusively. And we have outlined the terms of how I'm going to get paid in our relationship. That's great. That's awesome. Super clear. But what happens when you go fill out 10 online lead forms for Zillow? And I've already signed a buyer broker agreement with Ricky Carruth. And now Zillow takes in those leads, I guess, and resells them and sells them to another agent. Like there's, that's a mess. It's not just Zillow, by the way. It's no, oh, yeah. Any, them. any lead mm -hmm. portal. Right. So because you can't have, what is it? The last number I heard in 2021 was like 86 million leads were distributed to agents. And yet there's still only like 5.5 million people that buy a house. So like these leads are going to multiple websites. And if you, to his comment, if you are, if you're, if the first point of contact with a buyer before they can look at a property, which will be where it's pretty standardized is you have to sign a buyer rep agreement. And then they keep going on and certain and filling out lead inquiry forms. Yeah, to your point, Ricky, like there's some serious flaws in the business models, like big problems there because all those leads are no longer leads. Yeah. Now that that being said, I think that it's important to understand the comment that you made. I don't think that buyer's agency goes away. I think that's a myth. The reason I say that is for everything Keith mentioned, and this is a very infrequent transaction. Look, I'll go on my soapbox for a sec. Agents suck at articulating value on the buy <laughs> side. We've never had to do it. 
We haven't because we were like, look, this is what we do. I'm going to help you buy a house. And by the way, it's paid on the other side. And the buyer's like, okay. Like we, nobody's ever sat down and treated a buyer. Super important comment. Treat a buyer like a seller. You're not going to go sit down with a seller and not do a listing presentation and provide comps and explain what you do and your value and the marketing and the advertising and all of this stuff. Do the same thing on the buy side. And here's the funny part, by the way. I guarantee you, if you spent time studying what you do with a buyer, you spend way more time with them and working with them than you do with a seller. Yet we don't, in most cases, sign a buyer rep agreement asking for exclusivity. We have to get good at this and it's not complicated. I'll, I'll use this one example that I just, I, it resonates with people. When my mom moved out of the mountains to a house because my father passed away, I used an agent, one of ours, and she, this, is, this is really important. She sent me the disclosure package for the property that my mom was going to purchase. My mom's a retired realtor, by the way, but she, this is 15 years ago. She doesn't know what the hell's in that package, right? And I'm not, I'm not studying this 55 plus community that she's moving into. It was 126 pages. So everybody hears that. By the way, when everybody talks crap about California, you can thank us for how big your contracts are. <laughs> you're you're <laughs> welcome. It, you're welcome. Um, and this is the point. This is so important. She sent me the disclosure package and in the email was like six or seven bullet points of things I needed to know. And then I was like, great, we'll talk about them tomorrow morning in our 30 minute update. And I, I said, I hit, I hit, you know, thank you and hit reply. What I didn't do until five minutes later was I was like, Looking at that doc, I'm like, I don't have time to read this shit. And I was like, man, I responded back. I was like, hey, 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 Don, how much, how long did it take you to, how long did it take you to read that thing? She's like, oh, I spent six hours going through that for you. See the problem? Yeah. I, as the buyer, didn't, there was no value to me in the email of the bullet points. And I didn't think about the fact that somebody had to read all that stuff because we suck at articulating our value. We have to actually stop stop sheltering our clients from everything and go, I went through this last night, took me about six hours to do, but here's what you need to know. Okay. Well now I'm adding components because if we want to get rid of the buyer's agent, have fun, go read that thing on your own and try to understand everything in it, in that specific yeah. community where you know nothing about that community and feel comfortable buying that property with all of this stuff. That is not a world that buyers want. So why but, do you think that they're leaning <clears> in that direction where the buyers pay their own commission, which increase the cost of the entire process? It really screws up the entire system, makes it harder for people to buy well, homes. And like, it's just, it, it, don't they see that this is going to be a no, huge negative connotation? This is a money on, grab. On the industry. This well, is a money grab by the lawyers. And the plaintiffs and, are just getting suckered in and con. No, well, hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. It is a money grab by the lawyers. I agree. As you know, look, any lawyers listening, and I apologize, but that's what lawyers do. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> okay. You're not apologizing. <laughs> no. <laughs> Keith Robinson is. Um, but it is a little weird. Okay. It, this a fiduciary relationship is a special, meaningful relationship. And mm -hmm. in a you fiduciary mean the relationship. You mean the lawyer and the plaintiff or the agent and the. Clients. Both. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Regardless All... of wherever you create a fiduciary okay. relationship, it's incredibly yeah. important. Yeah. It is very strange that for decades, our industry has not clearly communicated to their client for He's whom right. they are a fiduciary, He's right. how we get paid and by whom. And yeah. that is the flaw in the system. It Agreed. is yeah. a flaw in the system. And that yeah. should change yeah. because the agents who have said, don't worry about it. The seller yeah. takes care of that. Are that's full right. of, that's, yeah. that's not right. So yeah. that needs to change. Now, yeah. the way it changes is really important, and it may not change in a way that is best for the industry, but I believe in capitalism. Or the consumer. Or the consumer. I believe in capitalism. I believe in creativity. I believe in entrepreneurship. And I feel very confident that once we know what the rules are, we will figure out ways for yeah. ease of transaction. I agree. Okay? We, we will figure that out. But it's it's I think our industry has to take some personal responsibility yeah. for setting up a structure that there's no way if you were going on trial for murder <laughs> and your your attorney walked in and said, hey, go that extreme. But <laughs> sorry, yeah. fine. If you were going yeah. on trial for anything yeah. and your attorney walked in and said, hey, I'm going to save you a couple bucks. I'm going to re represent both sides. You'd be like, 
forget. I almost said something else. I don't know if we can on your podcast. I'd be like, forget that. What do you, yeah. what? I want my advocate. Yeah. I want my yeah. gladiator that goes into the arena to do battle for me and help me yeah. win. I don't yeah. want someone who's representing both sides. Both sides, which by the way, is the next battle. Yeah. To be clear. When yeah, this dual, is all sorted agency. out on this side, yeah. dual agency is 100% the next target by mm -hmm. the DOJ. So and it's I'm, like they're just continuing to tie our hands well, but further and further. They're not, but like, look, I mean, Dakis comment is crap. And I'm I'm not shy about this. I hate dual agency. I'm not talking about two. Conflict of interest, uh, you know, like those are these are questions that are going to come up. But to be clear, when all of this whole mess is done, the <laughs> very next thing that's going to get targeted is dual agency. Like yeah. it's a hundred percent guarantee that'll be the next battle. Because to Keith's comment, they want a world where I am clearly saying I represent you, and you pay me. Now that does not mean that I can't write a purchase contract. That there's a stipulation in that purchase contract that the seller offers a credit to the buyer to help pay my fees or that the seller pays me directly. There's going to be some rules around that, but that's certainly something that can be done. But I, I wholeheartedly agree with Keith that there, there, there's actually some change here that needs to occur mm -hmm. that will be better for consumers as well, as long as... And this is what the civil cases and what you know the lawyers are getting fundamentally wrong. They don't understand how this works. They're not paying attention to things because I'll well, take my know. comment back slightly. There's a part yeah. of greed here on money, but they partially don't understand it. As long as the mechanisms are in place for a buyer to be able to have representation and afford to do it and not have to pay for cheap, crappy representation, like I don't right. want the I don't want the court appointed lawyer representing me in my trial. <laughs> Um, that I think that those are the, those are the questions. And, and, and I, I do believe Ricky that we'll find a way to get there. I think there's a lot of posturing right now. There's a lot of, um, you know, is NAR going to appeal? Is it going to settle? Like, I mean, I'm pretty, pretty public. It needs to settle. The reason it needs to settle is, is that a, appeal could take three, five, seven years. The industry doesn't have that long with all these copycat cases they just don't mm -hmm. like it can't afford it that was kind so, of the next question do you feel like these cases could be kind of pushed out till we get a resolution on the they'll be back cases so then those go to court while we're waiting for this one to appeal and then those get appealed to if, pass if those. the if if we if NAR appeals and takes it on that track then all these other cases continue to move forward mm. and that's bad if they like, appeal if they appeal, that's if they, if they continue the appeal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. they haven't, there's a lot of things they haven't, they haven't filed yet to be clear. Right, they're right, working right. through that, but there's, they, but they've intimated still, that they're going to, they're go going to, the to they're yeah. going to go to the mattresses and appeal this and fight it all the way. Yeah. But yeah. they've also intimated that they're willing to settle as long as it's realistic. I mean, yeah. that's always been something NAR is open to doing, but that's, they're also fighting for ch changes that the plaintiffs want they're like, you know, we'll talk about a settlement, but we're not giving up on this. Like, you know, and that that's an example of uh, in their in their particular case, in NARS case, they want to see an offer of compensation still be allowed inside the MLS. They view it this way, by the way. They're fine with it can be zero, but mm -hmm. they want to provide an opportunity for the seller to offer compensation on the other side. Um, I, I think that so they want best... manda not mandatory, but the ability to. Mm -hmm. Right. Which Correct. really does make sense because there will be instances. Yeah. Look, the first time home buyer marketplace, if I, you know, I own some rentals, right? If and they're in that first time home buyer market segment. When and if someday when I go to liquidate that asset, assuming these changes have come into play, I'll be very comfortable offering the buyer's agent a commission because that's going to give me more access to more buyers and give me the maximum value for my property. Right. Mm -hmm. 
And so I per I'm speaking for myself, right? Just in case any attorney ever listens to this and wants to bring me in on a deposition, uh, I would be willing to do that. It would make logical sense to me. So there are use cases in which it would make sense to be able to communicate to the agent population that a seller is willing to offer a commission to the buyer's agent. That, that is important to NAR and it should be because that is uh, what will make it a more fluid and, and easier to transact, right? Yeah. What the Department of Justice wants is it can't be mandatory anymore. Okay, cool, fine. But allow us to communicate when a seller decides that they want to. So far, that seems to be a sticking point, at least from what I've been able to glean from talking to people. And when you look at the Northwest MLS situation, how realistic mm -hmm. is that? Like um, a lot of people look at that and say, okay, almost 100% of, of uh, sellers still offer it. You know, are those agents actually disclosing that they don't have to pay it um except, well, they're like, are there disclosures in that market that actually spell this out the way that you know it should be and sellers are still deciding after being told hey you don't have to do this they're still doing it or what i've never really got to the bottom of that do you yeah know? i haven't read the actual disclosure for it but i can tell you that that is also if you look at the 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 settlement with no select that's a that's a stipulation you can see that as becoming a standard to be clear is that there's a disclosure on this is compensation you don't have to do this it's negotiable etc um the 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 key in northwest mls for just for clarity is that i i believe that there is a disclosure of compensation but i do not believe i could be wrong and some of your viewers can correct me on this because i have not read it but i do not believe that there is something in there that states that you don't have to do it i could be wrong on that in either case they went to zero in la in october of last year yeah. And to your point, it was a negligible change in the way things yeah. are done because the agents are explaining this to people and telling them that, like, look, I mean, it's what Keith just said. It's like, uh, your house has appreciated 300% in the past year and a half, and we're the most <laughs> unaffordable real estate market in the history of real estate. Your buyer is going to be strapped to be able to afford the closing costs on this house. I really highly encourage you to come up with compensation for the buyer's agents because it's been done this way the past 40 years. And to be clear, if you don't, you may not have a deal because the buyer may not be able to afford to do that. And if they can't, then they won't have a, a, an offer that they're going to write. And then we're going to be sitting on this property. And what sellers going to be like, okay, like, let's just screw it. Like, they're not going to be like, okay, we want to get a deal done. So it's part of the reason why I keep telling everybody not to panic so much. Like, there's going to be, to Keith's comment, this negotiation that's done in this process. Um, I think, Ricky, to your comment, though, and I think it's where you're, you're alluding to, you're going to see this with everybody. Yeah. You're gonna see it go where every MLS you can it's you you know you can do zero or whatever if it's not outright banned by the DOJ and you're gonna see a disclosure that's signed by the seller very quickly understanding compensation is negotiable you don't have to offer anything to the buyer's agent like that's gonna be a hundred percent standard I think that's process the best outcome honestly yeah yeah, yeah. I I mean. Look, there's even some people that I've talked to and you know maybe they're sadists or whatever, but they're kind of excited about these potential changes because they know they're damn good at what they do. Yeah. And so they can't I've been, wait. I've to been I've been excited like a kid in a candy store the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Like I now I look, I've got perhaps too much, but I've got confidence in my abilities. So yeah. I would much rather have a conversation with a buyer and be in control of my destiny on how I get paid and how much and how I tweak it and how I don't and what I do and what I offer, because now I can craft and curate an offering where I could go win even more business or yeah. win more business at a higher rate. And But I'm in control now of my destiny versus being at the mercy of some good or not good agent and how they've negotiated on their listing presentation. Going back so some, to the zero commission thing and NAR wanting to keep that, keep the option <laughs> open where you can offer it. You know what the lawyers say about that, right? They say, you're just trying to keep, keep something there so that, you know, buyer's agents are still yeah. around and you've got high membership and you've got all these fees coming in. That you keep your fees high, et cetera. What well, the irony of it is when lawyers are charging 30 to 40% on these cases, <laughs> like, the give me a break. That's the funniest part of this whole thing. Um, give me a break. Like I, my, my aunt and uncle, my, my aunt, they're married by the way. My, my uncle's a, 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 a lawyer and she's a judge. Oh. Anyway, Thanks, yeah, you can. Thanksgiving only must be a good time. Um, 
<laughs> but they're all like, but even they're just kind of like, this is, there's an element of this is, it's not like these, these plaintiffs randomly came up and thought about the fact that I like got sure. screwed one day. It's, no, they it's were not curated. how that worked. So they no, were they curated were curated into this conversation. Even, even, even the guy on the stand said he was happy with the way the deal went. <laughs> then his lawyer asked him, do you think that Remax, um, uh, conspire with the defendants to to get in your back pocket. He said no. There was zero <laughs> evidence presented to be clear on a conspiracy. There was not. And in, in no the, emails, you're, you're, no nothing. That and I'm not. And I'm to be clear. I'm not. I wasn't at the trial. I had friends that were yeah. there, and I was kind of getting play by play. But there was zero evidence of a conspiracy that was that was played out because there isn't one. That we right. all know that now. Right. All that aside, this is where we are today, and you know we have to move forward and understand what it is. I I think the the comment that Keith made is interesting. I'll throw another thing out there, and we only run out of time here. But you know, it's um, there's a lot of conversations about business model shifts. Is this going to be the the end of the buyer's agent? Is it going to change things? And I, I want to reiterate a couple comments that I think is important for people to hear. Number one. Uh, they're like, okay, are we going to become lawyers and and charge hourly? Well, first of all, the IRS carve out that we have as an industry where all the agents can be independent contractors, you can't charge hourly. Otherwise, you're no longer an independent contractor. I just want to be clear. So like, unless everybody wants to be employed by their broker, and I, I'm going to speak for about 99% of the brokers community and saying they're not going to put you on their payroll as W-2, um, <laughs> That's not realistic. So then so it's just for the viewers. Hmm. So they understand how, why the lawyers get to do that. Why the lawyers get to do what? I'm sorry. Charge by well, the they, hour. Well, they're not oh, because they're employees. They're not yeah, independent they're, contractors. They're, they're employees. They are employees. Lawyers are uh -huh. independent yeah, yeah. contractors. Yeah. 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 So we have a specific carve out in our, in our, in our industry on that. And, and that, by the way, is an example of the great thing that NAR does for you. Like we have a whole pot on this, but like, there are so there are a lot of you are like let's burn any art of the ground. I'm like no 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 no. There's a lot of things that are happening that you are not educated on that you need to pay very close attention to. One of those is every single year they are trying to make sure that that carve out as a 1099 doesn't get removed Stays. by the government. Do you think and that's a whole. That, do you think that the way that agents haven't educated their buyers on what their value is that NAR is kind of in the same boat with their value to agents. Oh, 100%. They haven't really educated, mm -hmm. like, okay, they're the largest donors on Congress. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, can you tell us what the hell you did? I mean, like, I'm yeah. on your <laughs> side. I'm like, let's keep NAR. Right. Yeah. Let's no, keep, the advocacy I'm, I'm part boat. is so important. Yeah. Like, we did, we literally just did a whole pot on this with the federal liaison for the, the basically does all this advocacy. And it was, I was like, oh my God, I forgot about all those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, no, NAR needs to do better. Um, but also, uh, every realtor in the industry needs to actually pay attention. Uh, you need to read some of the emails. You need yeah. to go to meetings. You need to do some of those things and not just read a headline about stuff and educate yourself because part of personal responsibility is also educating yourself. And like, even Keith and I are like, when we, before we did the pod, we started looking stuff up and we're like, damn, I didn't know about all those bills that they crushed. Forgot about so, this. Forgot about that. I mean, like how many of you got PPP loans, which has never happened for independent contractors. You know why never. you got those? NAR advocated for that. So yep. I'm not saying that NAR doesn't need to change. There's, there's a lot of stuff that needs to change there, yep. but we also need to remodel it, not build the burning down. Two other yep. comments, Ricky. Um, menu of services is certainly something that's interesting. I think you might see more of that pop up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Flat fee. I will just simply state, if you go back in time so far in the United States, and you can go to Foxton's, you can look at Purple Bricks, you can look, I mean, hourly on Redfin hasn't worked out. Like yeah. these models haven't taken hold. And mm -hmm. I, I, everyone's like, oh, this, this whole model is going to shift. I'm like, I mean, maybe, and I'm not saying that there won't be some new players on the block, but so far Americans like the idea of full service and not discount service offerings. Yeah. And so until somebody cracks that code, I'm not convinced that'll be the norm in the model going forward. 60 so. seconds left. I've heard you say that we're going to lose a lot of agents. If in fact, these large, you know, changes happen in the industry, how do agents not be one of the ones that have to leave the business? Can I run Maybe. this one? Yeah, yeah, you go. Yeah. Look, there are three things that James and I have both been telling everyone in our company and candidly, anyone who will listen in the industry to prepare for. Okay. So number one, we believe the buyer broker agreement will become mandatory in every state across the country. So learn how to talk about it. Most states have one. 
go look at it, print it. It'll look different when all the rules come down, but get comfortable having a buyer broker agreement discussion, practice mm -hmm. it, role play it, get, get on a coaching call with Ricky Super and easy. have him, yeah, have him talk to you about how he talks about it, but practice yeah. your buyer broker agreement conversation. Number two, your buyer consultation of tomorrow better look a lot like your listing presentation of today. So instead of we do a great job at this visioneering exercise, tell me about your perfect house. You want a large lot. What for? Oh, you got two dogs. Awesome. If it was a small lot, but a dog park was across the street, would that still work? Right. All this stuff we do every day is great. You've now got to add all the things you do on your listing presentation, like your market. How are you different? How are you differentiated? And why are you worth what you cost? Mm -hmm. So your buyer consultation, you better level that up. Number three. Yeah. Now negotiation has always been part of the business and candidly a part that most agents aren't great at because you have a beautiful servant's heart. You answer that phone call at 10 o'clock at night to go over the home inspection with a crying buyer. And that's part of the skill set that's needed. But that beautiful servant's heart makes you not a great negotiator. You have to level up your negotiation skills. They've always been important. They're going to be paramount when now you are forced to negotiate for your commission with a potential buyer. So, so James, get before you go, 60 seconds, why are agents going to quit? Why, why would they quit because of this, because of some change? Why are they going to quit? Yeah. Why would, why, why are we going to lose 20%, 30%? Why, why are we going to lose 40%? In the industry it's going to be 40%. I think when it's all said and done, why, um, why are that many agents going to leave the business? It's amazing. Because they're, not, business. because they're not willing to do the hard work. This isn't, this is the days of like everything popping in your lap is gone. Like we have to get good. Dakey's comment, who's talking about negotiation, learn to negotiate, go get your top five books for negotiation. Like you have to get very good at articulating your value. And if we can't do that, then you won't be here. But that's not, there's a reason why 10% of the agents do 90% of the business. They're good at what they do. They have a coach, they listen, they educate themselves. They're willing to work hard. You told your story on our podcast. I think it's important for everybody to hear that. Like you have to be willing to pick up the phone and have people hang up on you nine times out of 10, but it's that 10th call that makes the difference. You got a hold of somebody that was interested at that moment in time. And most people, and not just agents, but most people aren't willing to have the door slammed in their face that many times. And well, so- Well, James Keith, thank you guys so much for coming yeah, on. Man. You guys go check out their podcast. What is it called again? Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered. Let's do it, guys. You go out there, right. subscribe to their channel, check them out. They always have incredible guests. And check um, out these, the one with Ricky. He tells his story. It's really yeah, awesome. And, you guys and, and enjoy these guys it. are so. well connected in the industry, you know, interviewing, you know, the CEO of Zillow and, you know, other big, huge pillars of the industry. So go check them out, guys. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing Appreciate your insights. It. Thanks, Ricky. Got it. See you guys.